Hello, troublemakers. I am back. Fear in a movie is back. It's been a while. I feel like I'm forgetting something, though. Nose ring. No. Winning smile. Still there. What could I be forgetting? Uh, it's... Oh, the beer. And also the movie. I'm talking about shows, so there's no movie. There's no beer or movie. You know, it's been a while. Well, let's knock the rust off without a beer, without a movie. And today we're going to talk about a couple shows. But I am happy to be back making another beard in a movie. Ah, sorry, slip of the tongue. I said beard in a movie. Complete accident. I wasn't trying to draw attention to the fact that I've been growing this manly beard. But since we're talking about it, I, I am a man. That's a thing. And I like man things. I like football. I like meats. Grilled meats, specifically. But an underrated man interest is our secret love of female-led YA adaptations. We're not allowed to talk about it because it's not manly but we love it. All of us. And if we deny it, it's because we have to. Sorry guys, I have to spill the secrets. Fate Wing Saga, Cursed, Shadow and Bone. While we will discuss all three shows individually, just know that one of these shows was so bad that I wanted to pluck the eyeballs out of my face and donate them to a blind child. But then a blind child would have to live in a world where they'd be able to see this show. And qu quite frankly, I think they're better off blind. Let's start with Wing's Fate Saga. And I gotta give the show credits. This show is actually really good at meeting my expectations for garbage. It's awful. This show is adapted from a cartoon about fairies. Apparently, I I wouldn't know. I, do I look like the kind of guy that watches a show about fairies when I was a kid? No, come on. I spent my childhood watching more realistic things, like four turtles who lived in the sewers with their rat father who only came up to fight crime occasionally. You know, shows grounded in realism. Netflix made the decision to age up this cartoon fairy show and make it a little bit more edgy. For example, they start the show with a violent murder. Uh, hey turtles, we might need you to fight some crime here. Bloom here is the main character and she's part of a friendship ensemble. These five have all different kinds of powers. See this one here, she reads emotions. This one, she can turn invisible, I think. <laughs> and then of course we have Bloom here who Fire, right? Redhead, makes sense. She's she's kind of like a Charmander. And then, uh, yeah, so then this one would then be Squirtle, and then this one would be Bulbasaur. Well, let's make them all Pokemon. Okay, so the first one, the the emotion reader, she kind of she'd be like a uh, Abra, and then uh, the invisible one would be kind of she'd be like a Clefairy maybe. Uh, I just really had to dig so deeply into my 14 year old brain to find out those Pokemon names. Anyways, the original Winx was a show about friendship. That was the core of the show. I have read. So naturally, Netflix, when they decided to adapt that kids show about friendship, they decided to make the girls all hate each other. Now, I always knew that you were a teacher's pet. I just didn't realize that pet was a rat. But if you want to escalate... Now, I want it to be known that I had intended to sit down and watch all these shows beginning to end, right? Really commit. But after two episodes of Wings Fate Saga, I wanted to die. And I fear that if I had watched the whole show, I might have from boredom. So I instead skipped episodes three, four, and five, and went to the finale, episode six. So in those three skipped episodes, I had assumed, in the because the first two episodes, the girls don't really like each other, but I had figured over the next three episodes they would bond, and by episode six, they'd be BFFs, because that's what the show was about, friendship. I was hoping to see exchange necklaces with BFFs on it, maybe uh, bracelets, anklets, maybe. If you give your best friend an anklet, like, there's no bond stronger than that. Swapping anklets is one of the most intimate things that you could do with the person. So let's check in episode six. Uh, are they arguing again still? And the worst part is that instead of having the show about friendship, they decided to make it moody and they added this guy because Hollywood thinks that they need this guy. And if, if we're talking Pokemon, he, <laughs> he's Slowpoke. <laughs> just every time he's on screen, he's just like, yeah, Slowpoke. You see, Slowpoke dated Clefairy, right? They're like the popular kids. I guess it's kind of accurate because popular kids, they never get a personality. It takes childhood insecurity to grow into a good personality. And when you're attractive all the time, you know, you never feel forced to like have interesting things to say because people like you anyways. I've talked about this several times before and I will never get off because it's a true thing. So anyway, Slowpoke dated Clefairy and then over summer break, Clefairy was like, I think we should see other people. And then Slowpoke was like, Slowpoke. And then when they get back to school, Clefairy is like, hey Slowpoke, I better not catch you talking to Charmander. And then Slowpoke is like, Slowpoke. And then this teacher here reveals to Slowpoke, he's like, I knew your father back when he was alive. And also, I'm the one who killed him. And then Slowpoke is like, Slowpoke. 
I'm really not trying to be too mean, but I'm convinced that if you poke this man's face with a needle, his whole head would deflate. There's just nothing going on. <laughs> you could have taped a balloon to a mannequin and drew a smiley face on the balloon, and you would have gotten the same performance. But I wanted to watch a show about friendship. I didn't want to watch a show about like, will they, won't they, but they totally will. I don't care about him. Maybe because I skipped three episodes, but I think it's just like a thing that he's just not worthy of being cared about. Okay. You know what made me skip the those three episodes in the middle of the season there? I skipped it out of anger because episode two ends on a cliffhanger. I was like hooked in. They got me. I was ready to watch the third episode. So at the end of episode two, Charmander is in a room with Squirtle and Squirtle's just out there talking and then all of a sudden the camera cuts back to Charmander and Charmander's like, Doo. she's like in a trance and we're like, oh, what's going on? And they even did the sound effects, the do right? And you're like, ooh, this is gonna be interesting. And then they cut to credits. So you're like, oh, next episode now. See, what I thought was gonna happen is Bloom, she can't really control her powers. That's like a plot line. In fact, she burned her mom. <laughs> she just burned up her mom. Which is like, it's not funny, but it's so funny. Her mom has like serious burnage, like third degree burns. Well, not on her face. You can't see it because they don't want you to be disgusted as you're watching the show. They don't want to mangle the actor's face so that you go, ah, I can't watch anymore. That way everyone can be pretty and you don't want to turn off the show. But what I was thinking was going to happen is Charmander goes into this trance and she can't control her powers. So all of a sudden she's just like avatar mode. She's just burning people. And I, I think that's what I miss from the show a lot is just like people being on fire more often. It certainly would have maintained my interest if just every so often people are running around on fire. So she would be on a rampage and all the other Pokemon and... Uh, the fairies, they would have to like come together and fight her and she's out of control avatar mode. But with her combined powers and their bur burgeoning, and their burgeoning friendship. That would have been so fun because then the girls would have this like common trauma to bond them together. So I'm prepared. I click next episode. I'm getting ready. I'm excited. I'm thinking after the first two episodes, which were very tame, no friendship, very little power usage, no one burning alive. I'm about to see some chaos. So next episode starts, we pick up right where we left off. Her eyes go white. Turns out, it's just a setup for a flashback mechanic. We're just doing a quick flashback. 30 seconds, in and out, nothing, nothing really happens. Now I know cliffhangers, they're not quite the same as they used to be with the advent of streaming. Because cliffhangers were meant more so for people to talk about the next day, like, hey, did you see that? And to build interest so that you tune in next week. That's what cliffhangers purposes are for. When you're watching a show on streaming, you just go to the next episode right away. However, you can't set up like a really cool event about to happen and then not pay that off. Because you know what that makes me do? It makes me cry inside and skip your next three episodes and skip right to your finale. <laughs> and you know what the worst, the worst sin of the show is? And I'll die on this hill. <laughs> Who am I, Slowpoke's father? <laughs> we'll talk about him dying on a hill a little bit. For as violent as the show started, with like a, a shepherd getting his throat slit, just blood splattering on rocks, you think that this is about to be a violent show. The main scary villains of season one are the burned ones. Then they look like this. I did want to see people on fire. I didn't want to see, this is boring. I want to see humans on fire and burning alive and screaming. Of the three episodes that I watched, this right here is the best action sequence of the show. In a show about superpowers, or fairy powers, but they're super, super fairy powers. All she does is go, ha, and then the water girl goes, whoosh, and then that's the whole thing. And that is the best fight sequence in the show. You don't want me talking about the worst action sequence of the show either. <laughs> it is frustrating to see because they set up the burned ones to be pretty powerful. One burned one took out like a whole platoon of trained soldiers, specifically trained to fight demonic creatures like this. I still never figured out quite why they're, they train them with like hand-to-hand -hand weapons, like swords. Like this is in 1445. We can, why are we not training them with guns? Bow and arrows even, if you wanna stay with like the medieval weapons for some reason. So there's like 20 soldiers and then one burned one. The burned one just wipes out this platoon and the girls stumble upon the bodies and they're like, Oh, this is pretty crazy, huh? And then one of them, they know one of them. They're like, hey, is that is that our teacher? He looks like he's alive. And it turns out he makes a full recovery, making him the only one to survive with no injuries. So the only person to survive was the one speaking actor and then the, all the extras died. Now this is just a little complaint because like I know how Hollywood works, right? But it just feels very fanficy when the one speaking actor survives with no lingering injuries while the rest of his platoon 
who don't have any speaking lines, they all die. It's like, eh. but it is kind of a fanfic show. <laughs> like the the whole thing feels very like no one gave a shit. I guess would be the best way to put it. There's a scene in the final episode where the burn ones are like pounding on the windows and they're barricading themselves into. What was it, like the, the cafeteria? So they're all barricading themselves in, the burn ones are trying to break through, and all the students who are on the verge of dying to these terrifying creatures, they're all just like... Just silently waiting. And it's so quiet in there, and I'm like, where's the panic? Where's the sense of urgency? The burned ones have infiltrated the barrier. And the school. The burned ones may infiltrate the space before they arrive. None of the extras committed, and I don't really blame the extras. That's on the director, and also the sound design. If I'm about to die, I'm about to be screaming. What are you gonna do, tell me to shut up? What, what kill me? I'm about to die anyways. You can't stop me. Ah! I'm yelling, I'm screaming, I'm shouting, I'm farting, I'm peeing, I don't care. What are you gonna do, stop me? Try. Try to stop me from farting. Meanwhile, as they're all about to die, Charmander and Slowpoke are arguing about a kiss that they had, and like some miscommunication after a kiss, and it's just like... Dog, bigger picture here. And really, I just, the, the director and showrunners didn't really understand their own world that they tried to build. Because again, these are trained warriors who are made to fight like mythical creatures. And they can train them with swords, so close combat. And then one of the burned ones gets right in the face of one of the warriors. And the girl just like, do something! Swing at it. Why are you not? Why are you just standing there? It's like sniffing your face. Nothing pulls me out of a show more than when characters don't act in a logical way. If she is a trained warrior, she needs to be fighting it when a threat approaches her. Then you have two like of the top students who are walking down a hallway and they know a burned one is inside the school walls and then they hear a noise and they're like, oh, hold on. There's a noise coming from that hallway. And instead of pulling out their weapons, they just stand there like, what's it gonna be? Who's coming around the hallway? Oh, it's friendly. Okay, we're good. If a possible threat is coming around the corner, pull out your weapons. I don't, uh, that just, it frustrates me so much. And that's a, it's director, that's director. And finally, the scene that made me hate this show with a passion. They meant for me to sit through six episodes of this show with little to no friendship, no good fight sequences, a terrible love interest, and this is the finale battle that I get? This is the climactic battle scene? Charmander goes avatar mode again and just goes pew, pew, pew. And then burns the burned ones, which I guess double negative unburns them. I don't know. I'm not joking. They get unburned and then they die. I think. I don't know. So the whole season's scary villains, they get taken out with next to no effort. The show's target demographic is female, so I can understand a little bit not putting as much emphasis on battle scenes, but why not just do it well? Why not take the time and put some effort into making the battle scenes look good? Do you know what's cool? Do you know what I love more than almost anything? I love a good duel. Two people squaring off one-on-one. -on -one. one lives, one dies beautiful setup. So one huge story moment in episode six is the, the fight between the guy who killed Slowpoke's father and Slowpoke's father. They have a disagreement about what's the proper course of action and they come to blows and they're like, all right, let's just settle this one-on-one. -on -one. Now keep in mind that these two are supposed to be like the best fighters in the kingdom. Like they're the best. So we're about to do it. We're about to do a cool duel. They draw their weapons and I want you to guess. I want you to guess the amount of time that this duel lasts in seconds. Now when you're guessing, guess a comically low number. In a show that's meant to entertain you, of course, a show should have a duel that lasts, I don't know, maybe like two to three minutes minimum. You know, one person gets the advantage, gets the upper hand, and the other person, uh-oh, they get a little too cocky, then the other person takes advantage. There's like ebbs and flows to a fight. This show, however, decided that the duel is only gonna last, wait for it? Just wait, just wait for it. 1.83 seconds. Just saying 1.83 seconds? That took longer than the duel. <laughs> I timed it out. I was so bothered by this. I pulled out my phone timer and timed it. And it's just like, it's a nondescript hill and the blow, the fight isn't interesting at all. How could it be? It lasts less than two seconds. Not that there's anything wrong with only lasting two seconds. I mean, I don't, we should just judge people blindly based on a time, an arbitrary time, because, you know, sometimes other factors are at play here, okay? There's, there's like, stress needs to be going through. It happens! Sometimes it happens, okay? All in all, very disappointed, Winx. You... Winx, are you an equestrian? 
because you really understand lameness. <laughs> Overall, very disappointed. I give Wings Fate Saga a 1.83 out of 10. Hey, listen to me. Go listen to little Dylan down here. Listen to big Dylan here. Hi. One final note about Winx that little Dylan failed to even realize. What an idiot. Even I didn't realize it until deep into the edit. But there's some serious product placement in Winx Fate Saga, and I feel the need to call it out. Because it's just like, it's so in your face. So the mood reader girl, you know, she's always wearing headphones. And it's like, we all know you're listening to Audible. Which has thousands of thousands of audiobooks, and is the number one place for spoken word entertainment. So go ahead, Winx Fate Saga. Throw that product placement right in our face. Maybe make it a little less obvious next time? Or you know what? Make it a little bit more obvious. Just lean into it, right? Just come out and say, this is sponsored by Audible. I think that would be the respectable thing to do than trying to slide it in under our noses. This video is sponsored by Audible, by the way. Want to know a fun fact about Audible? They're actually my father. If you don't sign up for Audible using my link, which is audible.com slash Dylan is in trouble, then you are insulting my family. And I don't take that lightly. If at any point you're watching this video and you're like, how is Dylan so good at understanding stories? He knows when they're good. He knows when they're bad. He knows when they're in the middle. <laughs> it's because I consume a lot of stories, but reading like a book, it takes a lot of time. Audiobooks are so convenient and they're immersive on a different level. Each month that you're signing up to Audible, you get a credit to spend on any audiobook of your choosing. You'll also be granted access to the Plus Catalog, which has many great on-demand listens. Remember that link I mentioned to audible.com slash Dylan is in trouble, which will be in the description box below? Use it and you'll get 30 days for free, which means that you'll also get a free credit to use and spend on any audiobook of your choosing. And even if you cancel after 30 days, you still get to keep that audiobook forever. It's yours. To make it even easier, if you're on your phone right now, which I know you are, Rebecca, I can see you. <laughs> then just text Dylan is in trouble to 500 500. It'll make the whole process so easy. That way, next time you're running errands or you just want a little something in the background while you do something else, throw on an audiobook. Spoiler alert, I like Shadow and Bone. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later in the video. It's based on a novel, and since you get a free credit anyways, and you're like, I don't know what to use it on, maybe give Shadow and Bone a listen. Or take your free credit and spend it on literally anything else. It's all yours. It's just free. Free. My father gives you free stuff. Thank you, Audible, for supporting my channel by sponsoring me. Thank you to you guys for supporting Audible by using my link. Let's keep moving. Cursed. So here's the thing about Cursed. It was awful and I don't want to spend too much time talking about it because it's just going to bring up bad memories. And I knew it was going to be bad from the jump because the opening scene is Hannah Baker underwater dying and I'm like, I've seen this before. <laughs> for clarity, that's a 13 Reasons Why joke. Get ready because there's going to be several more. Cursed is the story of, you know, King Arthur, Merlin, Sword in the Stone, right? You know that legend? Well, this is a retelling of that, but we're telling it from Hannah Baker's perspective. There's something in Hollywood called blocking. In order to get certain shots, actors need to stop on certain marks. And that's one thing Curse does really poorly, is having their actors stop on certain marks. It's very clear that the actors are thinking about it. It feels several times in the opening scenes of, of Curse, I could visibly see actors walking up to a mark, hitting it, and then turning, it just takes you right out of it because it's like, oh, I can see you trying to act. And you might be thinking, Dylan, that's fine. That's not that big of a deal. Just overlook it. Okay, I'll overlook that. You know what I don't think I can overlook? Talking deer. Oh, but don't worry. Don't worry. The deer doesn't talk with its mouth. It speaks telepathically. Death is not the end. Save them. And then we have some poor editing, so the deer takes a <laughs> an arrow to the throat. And then we cut back to Hannah Baker, and then she reacts. So it's this weird sequence, this is bad editing. The deer gets hit, and if you if you see something like that, you're just instantly reacting. But instead, they show the deer, take the hit, start to fall, then they cut to Hannah, then she reacts. It's horrible editing, and I I'm not gonna talk about the show too much. <laughs> One person I do like is this guy, who I'm gonna call Game of Thrones because I think he was in Game of Thrones. So he's a, a creepy guy with loaded dice. And loaded dice, if you don't know what they are, they're dice that basically roll the same thing every single time. They're weighted differently, so they always fall in a certain way. And Hannah Baker's in a bar with him, and she's like, oh, I wanna roll. And she knows that the dice are loaded. So Game of Thrones is like being all creepy, and he's like, hey, let's bet for something, huh? If you win, you get a couple coins. If I win, I get a smooch. Also, he compliments her skin at one point, so he's he's pretty smooth. He's good at courting ladies. Look at that fine skin. Now he's a skis ball, right? And she knows that he's not gonna pay because he's cheating and he's not expecting to lose. And she she knows he's not gonna pay because he's just a low scum guy. Despite that, she's like, no, I'm gonna play anyways. Despite the fact that there's nothing in it for me, I'm going to play this game and I'm gonna use my magic 
to win. Because Hannah Baker has magic. I should... <laughs> important note. But here's the thing. Magic is like outlawed in this world. I don't think that's true. People just look down on it, I think, or something. I just... I didn't finish the show. This one was 10 episodes. And after like 30 seconds, I was like, this show is the worst. But see here... Here's what I was thinking. See, Hannah Baker lived in the woods. She hadn't had any human interaction up to that point, I think. I don't remember too well. Thank God. So the way I would have had it is Hannah comes into this bar not having human interaction, not knowing people are nefarious, thinking the best of humans. And then this guy has loaded dice. And then she plays, he decides the better, she's like, oh, sure, this is what humans do. So they bet, she loses, and then someone alerts her, hey, these are loaded dice. So she's like, oh, screw that, in order to get out of the debt, I'm gonna use my magic to win. But instead, that's not how it goes at all. She's like, no, I know I'm gonna lose unless I use my magic, but I'll take the bet anyways. Then, I'll win the bet, then I have to run away because... I'm using magic and they're gonna capture me. I did there's no value. There, I don't understand why she took the bets. It bothers me to this day. To this day! To, to this, this day. day! I don't know, maybe I'm being unfair. Maybe she had her reasons. Maybe she has 13 reasons. <laughs> I will give a compliment to the show. This little kid, oh, he's going places. <laughs> The joke doesn't make sense to you now, but it will in a little bit. So Hannah's village is being attacked because people hate magic users, and her village is in the woods, just a bunch of magic users. So she huddles with a little kid, and she's like, hey, yo, you gotta go. So she's like, run to, like, this specific point, and don't stop for anything. And this kid takes off. I don't think I've ever seen a more committed sprint from an actor ever. Like, he just... <laughs> something not so great from the show, uh all the other actors. There's this really funny moment when they're about to burn Hannah at the stake, which I was ready for. I was pretty excited, like people on fire. It's a thrill of mine. I will see therapy, but let's just get to this video first. But all of a sudden an arrow comes down and they're like, uh-oh, archers to the north. Right, you hear that? You hear the guy say archers to the north? So this guy decides the best protection from archers to the north is this little, this little hut right here. <laughs> no, don't worry. You'll be super safe under there. This actor, he just has no clue what's going on. He's the one that shouted out, archers to the north. Then he gets under this tiny little protection that only gives him protection from the west. And then he looks south. He's in a blender. He just has no clue which way's which. There's also this really weird dance with PG versus PG-13 slash R-rated stuff. I don't know what the show's trying to be. Because at one point, Hannah Baker's mom's about to die. And I'm like, ooh, yeah, I can't wait to see this. Therapy, I get it. But for whatever reason, right before the guy delivers the killing blow, they cut away. And then they cut right back to it after the blow has been, like, pulled back. So I'm like, okay, it's, it's PG, it's fine, whatever. But then at the end of the episode, Hannah Baker's got this sword, and she's just swinging it around, lopping heads off of its wolves. Blood is just spurting everywhere, and I'm like, wow. I thought, I thought we were going PG, but now there's just blood everywhere? And the reason that's a big deal is because if we see the blow that kills the mom, we're, I feel like that, that's more powerful. It's like we're seeing it, we're feeling it, we're experiencing it ourselves. It's like driving by a car crash. Like if you see the wreckage, it's like, oh, well, that seems pretty, pretty gnarly. But if you actually see the car crash happen, you're like, oh, whoa, that's, that's intense. So I guess my question is why cursed? Why not show the mom getting stabbed? Why derive me of that pleasure? Guess who comes back in episode two though? Game of Thrones, he's back, but he's pissed because he never got a smooch. So he corners her and she's got the important sword in the stone, right? So this is an important thing. And he's like, hey, what's that? That looks pretty important. Let me see it. And he's got her back in the corner and she's just like, no. And he's like, why won't you show me the sword? And she's like, I have my reasons. And then he says, do you happen to have 13 reasons? And despite the fact that he's being very forceful with her, he refuses to take the sword from her hand himself. So instead he's like, hey, Give me that sword, politely. <laughs> it's like, why don't you just take it? But instead she's like, okay. And then she pulls out the sword and lops his hand off, which is deserved. Like you could have just taken the sword, but instead you're like, hey, pull that weapon out and then hand it to me kindly. Cause I'm gonna steal it from you. What do you think she's gonna do with it? And then his boys who are holding back Hannah Baker's ally are like, Oh, shoot. Yeah. And then Anna Baker takes like two steps away. She starts, she turns to run. And the boys start to give chase. But after she takes those two steps, they're like, ah, she, she's pretty far away at this point. Let's just, nah, she can go. <laughs> she just cut off their superior's hand. And she's clearly not skilled with the blade or anything. But she like literally turns and takes a step. And they're like, ah, nah. Nah, it's too, it's too much, too much work. We gotta talk about this as well. Cause this was another thing that just, 
It was so bad. Okay, so this guy's like a legendary fighter, right? He's like this feared menace. World renowned for his fighting ability. He managed to kidnap the kid, the runner. That is until people from the village, the, the village that was getting attacked before, the ones who had escaped managed to track them down to get the kid back. And they managed to do it at night as well while they're vulnerable. The, the scary menace, the super glorious fighter happens to be sleeping. So they poke a rake into his chest and they're like, I could kill you right now. Why don't they kill him right away? I don't know. The man literally earlier in the day was slaughtering all their friends and family. So you'd think like, we might as well just kill him, right? But instead they're like, no, let's let him live. And also let's only have one person poke a rake into his chest while the other people just stand idly by without their weapons drawn. <laughs> just let one guy poke him with a rake. I'm sure that'll subdue him. It's not like he's super dangerous. There's even a moment where the guy holding the rake turns and looks away, which just gives the legendary fighter a glorious opportunity to just he just grab the rake and turn it but the fighter doesn't he's like no th this is fine i i can take a rake to the chest is rake that's not a rake is it what do you call it's like a <laughs> it's, it's like a trident it's like a hay trident because you use it for hay i'm gonna call it a rake i don't give a fuck so the rake guy is like let's tie him up and then they tie his hands in front of him and they're like okay great that's it that he is subdued there is no way that he is ever going to be capable of attacking us and killing us all. Ain't no way he's going to be able to do that. Okay, so he can do that still. Well, well, well. How the turntables... And I just... <laughs> <laughs> he has the audacity to say that the only reason he brought the kid is to lure out the rest of them. So he would, like, it was all like a big grandmaster plan to get them to come to him so that he could kill them, other than having to track them down. I've got no interest in the boy. He's bait. Bait? For what? For you. And I get it, it's supposed to be like a cool character moment where he's so badass, he's like, I saw this whole thing coming, I was ten steps ahead of you. But they literally could have killed him. Easily. Did he expect their ineptitude? Did he expect their kindness? He literally just got done slaughtering their families and friends. It's just bad filmmaking, bad writing. I just want to skip to the end. I just want to know what happened. What is happening? Why is there a dead antler guy? Wait, is this a child assassin? What did I miss? The next scene in the final episode is Hannah Baker, who's for some reason still alive. I can't work it out. Her and King Arthur are in bed. And then they proceed to have like a two minute conversation about if the dick was good. And then she's like, yeah, wait, with my puss puss good? And then they have, that's a whole, that's a thing. That's a thing in the final episode. They have that conversation. Oh, wait, is this Thor? Wait, is the show over now? Thank God. Cursed. 0.25 out of 10. Finally, I can talk about the actual good show. Shadow and Bone is a good show. I'm so excited to talk about it. I actually watched it when it originally aired and then I rewatched the first two episodes and the final episode like I did with the other shows. Uh, just to like remind myself of what I liked about the show especially. Immediately, I just feel like you can sense that this show is different from a visual perspective. And the reason for that is the color palette. Turn your attention to it. My children, it's less saturated than the other shows were. It's more dark, more gritty, more shadowy. See, this is a show about the girl with the power of light, which is a fabled ability, but you don't find that out until the end of the first episode, so pretend like I didn't just spoil it. So this is just an ordinary everyday girl who's just living life, part of the army. The big problem in this world is that there's this giant area on the map, and it's just filled with darkness. There's a bunch of monsters that live in this area. This big area was created by a creature called the Darkling, who was a powerful magician who used magic, dark magic, about 400 years ago. This man here is a descendant of the Darkling, and not the Darkling himself. What a foolish notion you just had. Why would you even suggest something like that? That was stupid of you. Why would you think that? Don't think that anymore. If the Darkling was still alive, he'd be over 400 years old. And this guy looks, what, like 40 at the most? In order for a 400 year old to look 40, he'd need some sort of like, I don't know, some magical powers or something. And this show doesn't have any magic in it. Uh, ignore, just don't, nope, ignore. Don't look at that. Listen to me, listen to my words. He is not the Darkling, okay? He's not. What he is, is kind of a love interest. We have a little bit of a love triangle going on. I know it's looked down upon. People don't love the love triangle because it's been done a lot. But I like the triangle. It's a great shape, a lot of sharp edges. You know what happens with sharp edges? People hit themselves on it and get hurt, and I love that. 
The triangle goes between the girl who has the magical light powers, and then we of course have her childhood friend, who is just super caring, supportive, loves her through everything. And then we have the not darkling. What does he have? He has a castle. And if there's one thing that I've learned, it's that bitches love castles. So it seems like a pretty easy choice. She's gonna choose him. Interestingly enough though, the, the story's perspective is split between not only these guys in the triangle, but these guys. These guys are a crew and they learn about the main character's existence. See, she's this fabled person. She's like the first person ever to use light powers. And they're like, oh, Let's go kidnap her then. <laughs> they actually have their own book, which is called Six of Crows. It's a completely different story set in the same worlds, but the show decided to kind of merge the two. What the previous two shows lacked was dynamic camera work. One shot that just comes to my mind right now is there's a shot of Merlin and he's talking to the king and it's like the worst color shot I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> First thing you'll notice is that they applied a blue hue to the shot. Overall, it's just not very fun to look at, especially when there's a lot of shadows and darkness in this shot. It just doesn't look aesthetically pleasing. And then also they decided to make all of the other set decorations predominantly blue. <laughs> so not only are they blue, but then there's like a blue coating over the entire shot. So everything just kind of feels homogenous. Shadow and Bone though, I could pull a dozen great examples. The first one that comes to mind is when the main character of the, the kidnapping crew, I'll call them the six because their, their book is called Six of Crows. So these guys are the six and these guys are the sh shadow and bone. They're the boners. <laughs> we'll call them the shadows and then the six, okay? How does that sound? So the leader of the six is alone in his room. He catches sight of uh, something in the mirror. He turns and then the camera does the slow push in and that slow push in is important. If it was just a static shot, it would, it would just feel a little bit stale, but there's like this slow creeping push, which just adds a little bit of intensity. Then over his shoulder, something moves behind him. And then we see the small expression on his face as he greets the person. I just have a feeling that if, if either of the directors on Cursed or Wings, if they had done the same scene, they would have just had the guy turn and then do over the shoulder, over the shoulder, over the shoulder, over the, it would have been boring. This is a way to block the characters. Blocking, remember that term? It's a way to block the characters so that it's a little bit more visually interesting to look at. And I actually want to give you another little nugget because I found this uh, a little bit jarring when they changed it, but it was so good when they were doing it. See, directors have different styles with their camera work, but even their ideas are unique. Now, the first two episodes of Shadow and Bone were directed by Lee Krieger. Now, these two groups of characters, they were separated by the fold, right? Which is that, that big dark area on the map that people couldn't really go through because of all the monsters inside of it. And if you look at the six, all their shots are a lot more warm than this, which is much more neutral. And I thought that was a fascinating differentiator because if you're cutting back and forth between the two, it's difficult to figure out exactly which world you're in every time you see a cut or a scene change. However, if you color it differently, it's just a way to like tap into your subconscious. You don't have to think about it. If you see warmer tones, you're thinking like, oh, we're back in the sixth side of the world. Whereas if you see something more neutral, you're probably on the, the shadow side of the world. I'm gonna throw up a bunch of images on the screen right now. You would be able to guess without any identifiers, without any characters, without any identifiable locations, you'd be able to figure out if you're on the shadow side of the world or on the sixth side of the world. That changes, however, in episode three. See, we start setting up a new character. Her name is Beatrice. No, nah, it's not it. It's not Beatrice. I'm just guessing. Now her colors are more neutral, so I'm thinking that she's on the shadow side of the world. All of a sudden, Beatrice is attacked and kidnapped, and then moments later, guess who shows up? The Six. And I wasn't like taking notes the first time I was watching the show because I was just watching for my own entertainment. I wasn't planning on making a video or anything. And I remember being really jarred by this. I had a hunch on what it was, and I went to go look it up, and sure enough, it was a different director. See, the first director had an idea for how to solidify the worlds and how to differentiate the shadow side from the sixth side instantly. I thought that was really clever. And then a new director comes in for a different batch of episodes. So when the new director comes in and then doesn't apply those same techniques, the same ideas, it kind of throws you off a little bit. And that's when it hit me. See, I knew I wanted to watch these shows and make a beer and a movie about it, but I didn't really know what the thesis was. I just knew that they were all Netflix adaptations. So Winx came from the cartoon. Cursed actually comes from a graphic novel by Frank Miller. And then Shadow and Bone, of course, is the adaptation from the book. And the conclusion that I draw after watching these three shows is that it doesn't matter. Nothing matters. <laughs> you can adapt Blue's Clues in a really adult way. It's a murder mystery. Blue has to solve a murder? And if you attach a good director 
and someone with a vision, a good showrunner if you want to make it a show, you get talent behind the scenes, you can make anything work. There is an art to storytelling, and it would be the same as hiring a horrible voice actor to narrate a classic story on Audible, which you should go sign up. Again, thank you to Audible for sponsoring this video. It just ruins the experience. You need someone at the helm, someone with the vision, and someone to carry that through. If you have a good story and a bad director or showrunner, you're gonna ruin the show. So that was the conclusion I came to. Thank God, because I needed to tie a bow on this video somehow. And the bow on this video is that good directing is good. Wow. See, when you say it plainly, it doesn't sound so good, but uh, when you talk for 30 minutes and break down a couple things, it sounds way more impressive. So, pretty impressive, huh? <laughs> oh, by the way, this guy, is, he's actually the Darkling. <laughs> Tricked you! I fooled you! How embarrassing for you. You thought he wasn't the Darkling. So embarrassing. Only for you. I'm not embarrassed that I set up that joke and forgot to finish it. It's not embarrassing. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot to finish that joke. <laughs> Thank you for watching this Beer in a Movie. Beer in a Movie is something that I'm going to make more of in 2022. I have a number of different ideas. I will bring beer back because I miss getting drunk. Thank you for watching this video. I'll see you next time. Toodles.